Okay, I think we'll, we'll get started and then I'm, I'm sure more people will join. Um, so thanks everyone for, for joining. And this is uh, our meetup for, uh, for the March, for March. This is only our third meetup. And uh, today I'm very pleased to have Samantha and Amir from uh, B Function. The title of the session is HP plus B Function, Modernizing Legacy Application and Data Source Faster. My name is Didier and I'm part of the HP Dev team. Uh, with me today is Denis. He's going to paste a few links as I, I talk and introduce uh, HP Dev very briefly. And after that, I will hand over to Samantha and Amir for the real content of the session. So, as I said, uh, this is a, a, a meetup series that we started this year in 22. Um, we already had a couple of sessions in January and February, obviously, uh, one on uh, Quarkus delivered by Red Hat, another one. Um, on um, uh, the subject <laughs> escapes me right now, but sorry about that. The, we have two more coming up. That's the good news. Uh, one is called Open Policy Agents, and this is going to be delivered by Stira. Um, and you can find on this page uh, the, the list of meetups that we are already uh, planning. And you can find not only the registration links, but also all the replay links. Um, so Streamlight was the second one. Sorry, my brain just restarted uh, after a quick uh, break. Uh, and then we have in May, we'll have um, Determine AI, uh, now part of HPE, will be doing a, a drill down on uh, Determine AI, the product itself. We have another series of talk uh, we call Munch and Learn. Um, and also these are monthly talks and uh, the, the registration page is on Munch and Learn, and, and probably Duny has, has pasted the link in the chat right now. And uh, again, the calendar has all the links to the replay. And the next session will be on Chapel. And uh, Chapel is, for those who are not familiar with, is uh, a, a programming, a parallel computing programming language that was created by Cray, now part of HP as well. And um, we will have uh, Brad Chamberlain uh, talking about how this helps uh, building parallel computing programs uh, on from laptop to supercomputers. So uh, this is April 20th, so next month, and uh, feel free to register for that. On top of that, we have a number of things in the HP Dev program that you might find interesting. For example, we have a, a program that we call Workshops on Demand, and these are based on uh, Jupyter Notebooks, and this is a great way to learn new technology. We have about 25 workshops available already in the catalog and they are available 24 by seven, free of charge. And um, you, can, uh, you can find some subject on uh, open source technologies or HPE technologies. The good news is this week is a big event in Europe called TSS in which we are heavily involved. And um, we are introducing uh, at least three or four new workshops during that event that we will make available in the catalog right after uh, TSS is finished. So uh, we just recently introduced one on Docker 101, but we have one, a new one on Ansible uh, and a couple of interesting one on uh, machine learning 101 and Spark. So take a look in the catalog uh, and you'll see, you might find interesting subject that you are trying to learn. Um, and again, this is a community which only works if people are contributing and, um, and, and making uh, the community well known. So please invite all those around you to join and uh, invite them to our talks. Um, you can also uh, invite them to subscribe to our newsletter. We have a Slack channel that we, um, we own and uh, we, we have dedicated, uh, uh, we have a workspace and dedicated channels for the different uh, platforms and technology that we cover. We have a Twitter account with a huge amount of followers. You can also decide to, uh, to follow Twitter if you are a Twitter person. You can also contribute. One way to contribute is to submit and write blogs. We have a pretty simple mechanism for contributing blogs. If you're interested, take a look at this um, uh, web page on our website, developer.hp.com slash contribute. Um, you can also deliver a meetup if you are like an expert in a particular technology. Uh, and you're interested, uh, reach out to us and we can find a slot for you. Uh, or you can help uh, working on uh, workshop on demands. Uh, we had several contributions of people who helped us build a workshop on demand, which is now available in our catalog. 
we have a QR code that you can grab to uh, catch all those links. Otherwise, I think Johnny has probably kindly copied them in the chat. You can use that chat to share some uh, information during the talk with uh, me and Samantha. You can also use the Q&A. It's even easier for, for speakers uh, to ask your question during the session, and we'll do our best to answer them. And with that, I will hand over to Samantha. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, and uh, good to see everybody. And we're excited to uh, share with you guys today. Um, in true technology fashion, my AirPods died. So sorry if the sound is weird at all. It literally happened like 30 seconds ago, right prior to this. So, all right, with that being said, let's go ahead and get started. I'll introduce myself first. Uh, my name is Samantha Cartwright. I run Global Channel and Alliances for V Function. Uh, Amir, do you want to introduce yourself real quick? Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Amir. I'm founder and CTO of eFunction. Good stuff. All right. So first, I want to thank HP for hosting us today. So we're really happy to be here and talk about how we can help you accelerate and automate modernizing legacy apps. So just before we dive into all of that, though, I'd like to talk a little bit about our partnership with HP. So we work very closely with HP Pointnext and the Esmeral teams to really bring the best experience for all of those legacy Java applications from assessment all the way to analysis of the applications into breaking them into microservices. Um, so with that being said, before I pass to Amir for more context and a demo, I'd like to just set the stage on the problems really that we help solve. And again, uh, throughout this, feel free to ask any questions inside the chat. So first I wanna talk about some of the big industry and developer challenges really related to modernizing legacy. So these are things that you're probably experiencing now or at some point have, but let's go ahead and dive in. So the first one being engineering velocity. So you have monolithic applications, they're legacy, they're getting bigger, technical debt is growing. What's pictured here is really the path it takes from monolithic apps to reach innovation. Clearly, you can see that it's not an easy one. So you experience long test cycles, long release cycles, you're unable to meet business requirements, um, poor customer experience. This really all leads to competitive disadvantage. And oftentimes we see for every dollar spent, only a fraction is going to innovation and the rest is actually being spent on technical debt. So as a result of that slow engineering velocity, what happens is application scalability, scalability becomes a huge problem. So things like excessive TCO, your applications can't scale out, there's no elasticity. And again, it impacts user and customer experience. So we've also seen scalability issues happen when developers tend to just focus on modernizing the UI, uh, modernizing the UI of an app. So this is like without actually modernizing the business logic of it. So Amir will get into that in his demo in a little bit. Um, but basically this is like bringing a shiny new UI, new UI to an application, but it's powered by like a 1990s Packard Bell computer. So microservices, however, offer a great solution to make application scalability, applications more scalable, cost efficient, and you're able to use more of the on-demand serv services with serverless technology like Lambda, Microsoft Azure functions, Google Cloud functions. Um, but again, this needs to start at modernizing the business logic of the monolith first. So with that being said, uh, v Functions developed this platform to really fill a major gap in the market and help developers and architects overcome some of the massive pain points that we just talked about, like engineering velocity, application scalability, technical debt, skills gaps, and of course there's others. So what is vFunction? So we're an AI application modernization platform. So our platform allows you to take Java apps, assess them, analyze them, design them, remove dead code, and ultimately break them into microservices or mini services. So this is all done on a single platform and it's a single user experience. So ultimately this lets you build that repeatable factory model and accelerate innovation by using technologies like HP, Esmeral, GreenLake, or serverless technology. So kind of just to summarize with three numbers here. So we can speed up modernization efforts by 20X. This allows you as a developer to really do more modernizations. Um, we help you reduce the cost of the overall modernization projects by as much as 3X. So this allows you to modernize applications that maybe were typically out of scope because of cost and complexity. And then ultimately we help you de-risk the whole project. So your business critical apps that were kind of in that danger zone of, for modernization, you're now able to modernize without much risk. 
So hopefully that set the stage a little bit. I'm gonna go ahead and pass it to Amir for more context and a demo. Thanks, Samantha. So, um, so I, I will speak like uh, how we explain this to our like organizations and how we can really disrupt the refactoring process for for firms and enterprises. But I also want to talk to you as developers and, and what you like to do with your application. So for developers. You know, us as developers, we, we're the first ones to know that our application is kind of crappy uh, and that the code is too rusty and that we need to refactor parts of it. But many times when we try to present um, this refactoring as a project that should be um, accepted into the backlog and, and, and just be done, it's, it's very hard for us to build the right business case. And it's very hard for our managers to, to understand if it's, we really need to refactor or not and how much they're actually gained from refactoring our applications. So uh, what we were trying to do with vFunction is really to disrupt the refactoring process. So if this graph here tells you what enterprises can do today, like the more complex the application, the less, uh, the, the, the lower the refactoring speed, which means that if the application is really, really complex, the organizations rarely uh, have time and, uh, and, and budget to really refactor those applications. And what we want is in vFunction is really to allow you to access your backlog of legacy applications and really refactor any application in a, in a, in a good way, in a riskless way. Uh, well, not risk-free, but, but de-risked way, uh, really, and allow, and allow you the visibility to make the right um, uh choices and decisions around how to refactor your applications. So what we do with V function is we help the strategic, we call it like the build the strategic modernization plan for applications. So we start with every application with, uh, with the assessment hub, with the V function assessment hub. And um, those of you view that will stay until the end of the demo will also get a, a coupon for a free license of assessment hub. Um, so we start by really measuring the, the, the assessed application and, and measure the technical debt in the application and the complexity in the application. And this is interesting because it allows you to, to, to really get like a data-driven approach to, to understanding how much is your application in need of refactoring. Because sometimes it's okay to say, you know what, I feel that this code is a little bit crappy, but it's actually, it won't uh, give me too much. It won't, there, there, won't, there isn't much return on the investment of refactoring. So um, so maybe sometimes it makes sense just to replatform an application or change the frameworks as part of modernization. Um, and, and we allow you to see that through the vFunction assessment hub. And I'll show you that in the demo, but basically what we're trying to do and we're, 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 we got to this model through a lot of machine learning is that how much, depending on like, we, we do like a clustering on the dependencies and, and, uh, uh, and we measure the length of the dependency chains and how much the dependency graph is intertwined. And, and based on that, we, we get to a point where we can tell you what is the total cost of ownership for your application. Like out of a dollar that you want to spend on development for that application, how much is goes into innovation and how much is going to feed the, the technical debt or to repay parts of the technical debt. And usually for applications where you see that, like in this example here, that the total cost of ownership in this screenshot is like a, a three times as much and it means that for every dollar that you that you're spending, actually only thirty cents of it uh, goes into uh, innovation. Then that is a problem, and that is how you, as developers, help the business build the right business case for you to refactor this application. Um, when you build a business case and you want to refactor, then with the, with the V function modernization hub. Uh, we allow you, so this is only static analysis, this uh, assessment hub, and he, the, here in the modernization hub, we, we, we also add on top of the static analysis, also dynamic analysis, where we analyze the running application. Um, and then it allows you as architects and developers to really analyze what's running in the application, to split it up into domains, to do an automated domain-driven design, uh, to get to, uh, to get a, um, 
uh, an offer from the V function platform on what is what should be the boundaries between your services and allow you as an architect to interactively engage with the platform and, and define uh, your target architecture or the target state of your code uh, based on how the application is currently built. Um, so I'll show you this again uh, more in the demo. But at the end, we want you to get to this realization. So with the analysis, with the dynamic analysis and the modernization hub, it, we allow, we allow you to understand what is the, your refactoring effort. And with the static analysis in the assessment hub, we allow you to understand the debt level. So you can, as developer can decide, as developers can decide, okay, if it's a low debt, but low refactoring effort, you know, you can do whatever you want. If it's a high effort, uh, but in a low debt level, so maybe don't touch the code, maybe just replatform it or change the frameworks, but don't try to mess around with the way the classes are built. If it's a high debt level and low refactoring, perhaps extract those services uh, using V function and run those as, as separate microservices or mini services. But if it's like really high debt level and really high refactoring uh, effort, start by iteratively refactoring that application until you slowly reduce the complexity, reduce the refactoring effort up until you get into this box here and extract those services with the function. So uh, how does it work? Um, so this is the way it works. I'll start from the left to the right and explain. We start with, as I said before, with static analysis. So through static analysis, we analyze the technical debt um, and it, this allows you to prioritize refactoring for your application. Once you decide to refactor your application, you go into the modernization hub where you add, uh, where you start with learning. So the system needs to run, um, while your application needs to run as V function analyzes it. Um, the reason we do that is because, first of all, it's very easy for us as people to understand like dynamic analysis because it's because uh, it's like something that goes on over time. It's exactly what's running the classes that are running within our application, the objects that gets that get access, the database tables that get accessed, um, and and for us it it helps us to kind of gain. Um, this, the, the right level of visibility into the application. Whereas if we just look at the static analysis, and I'm sure you've done this before, um, when you just look at static analysis of an application with a few thousands of classes, you just look, or you're, you're usually just looking at one big miss. Uh, because for us as developers, we don't really think about all of those static dependencies and compiling dependencies that we add as we develop. Uh, whereas we're, we constantly are thinking about the dynamic analysis because we are thinking about which method should call which other method, which class should call which other class. So, uh, so in fact, the dynamic analysis should be something that um, that we recognize, and then we kind of bolt on top of that a static analysis to allow you to really understand all the dependencies within your application. So this is the learning piece. Uh, after learning is done, so this can run either on a production system or in a pre-production system. Um, and once you have enough information, uh, the AI algorithms within the V function platform start to uh, solve this optimization problem of how to best split the application into domains. So it uses um, some heuristics around, you know, for instance, uh, different flows of the code that access the same database tables. So database tables might hint to um, the domain. Um, if it's like a spring, if we're talking about spring, so if it's like a spring bean and, and like two different flows are using the same spring bean, maybe that spring bean is also kind of um, uh, hints to the domain. If it's a spring bean that's used throughout in many of the services and many of the flows, Perhaps that's not so um, indicative of a domain, but rather something that you're just using as a, like a something that should be inside of a common library or a common service to um, to serve as like a foundation service for many of the of other services. Um, so with this information, with the information that we assess with this solution of this optimization problem, with all of the hints that we get um, that the AI gets around what's uh, 
of the domain and what's not of the domain. Uh, we present this to an architect and an architect can then interact with system and, and define his architecture based on the uh, initial suggestion done by the V function server. Once the architect is happy with this um, architecture, um, you can then download uh, service specification files, basically recipes on how to create the services from the V function server and run those recipes on your development machines uh, through another tool that we supply. And that takes the original source codes uh, and puts and, and creates a new service out of them. So it's basically like a Lego. It rebuilds uh, services based on your original building blocks, which are the classes. It knows how to modify the classes slightly, like remove unneeded methods, remove un unneeded dependencies, and remove dead code, and split classes based on like to take a, a class and split it up to two based on its method. If it's if the same class is used in two different domains. Uh, and you don't want to bring uh, all of the dependencies of that class into both domains. So that is like something that's very common. So that is all done automatically. And, and when you get there uh, and you extract those services and you compile them, then you get like a Maven project or a Gradle project that you can then, that is the basis of your, uh, of your new distributed platform. Uh, at the end here, uh, we can take these services and containerize them and dip and deploy them to uh, um, to a cloud, um, to a Kubernetes environment, or to uh, to HPE Esmeral, uh, and and allow you to start running your applications in a distributed way. So according to the V function methodology, you should first take their code, split it apart, containerize it, and run it as a distributed system. Make sure that that code is running, the system is still running, the application still works and then start to do more like modernization stuff, like add tests around those extracted services. So, so add the test harnesses so you can actually test uh, changes in the code, start to, test, to change um, uh, the specific services, the way they work, change the frameworks within them into more modern and cloud native frameworks. Uh, but constantly make sure that the entire application is working. That is a way to de-risk this whole project. Um, so from here, I'll jump to the demo. And this is the demo. So this is the V-Function uh, analysis uh, platform. Move stuff here. So what we're seeing here is an analysis of a small demo application. So this application is re it's really a small application that we built for demo purposes. We call it OMS, it's an order management system. It's like a retail application. So you expect things like inventory and shipping and payment. Um, and we ran through uh, the learning piece, which we do the dynamic analysis. This is what it looks like. The, the, AI, the AI runs in the background and it produced this initial view of these services. Every circle or sphere that you see in front of you is a service. The size indicates the size of the service in terms of number of classes. And the color indicates the exclusivity of the service. So before I mentioned that this is like an optimization problem, what we optimize for are certain metrics that we found to be uh, very important when you uh, define the boundaries of your services and that's the percentage of classes that will actually be exclusive to the service so if there are classes that are related to a certain domain you want all of them to be inside the service that serves that domain and you don't want those classes elsewhere in your code so uh, if if there's a high degree of exclusivity or a high percentage of classes exist only in this service, it'll get the green color. Medium exclusivity will get a blue color. Low exclusivity, which is more common in large applications than in this demo application, will get a pink color. You also get these dotted lines between the services, that these are calls between the services. And this black part in the middle is really the, uh, what remains of your monolithic application. So sometimes there are classes in here. Um, in this case, there are not. Uh, but any dotted line that comes out of this black hole in the middle are really endpoints of the system, whereas these dotted lines are really service-to-service -service calls um, in the application. So um, uh, 
and and by the way here on the right there are names to these services so every circle here gets a name the name is uh, there there's a lot of heuristics around how we give that name but it could be based on the methods that logically invoke the service it could be based on a common term uh, within the classes that make up the service uh, but it's all to make to to make you as our architects get a very quick view of the architecture of the system, the proposed architecture of the system, and to immediately understand uh, what are the domains that are within your application. I'll show you the base report or the assessment port for this specific application. So this obviously is a very small application. So so for it's based on, on, on our analysis that for every dollar that you innovate, that you want to spend on development, 91 cents will go into innovation and only 0.09% will go into debt, which means that it's basically, there's no point in really refactoring this application and not there's no point in splitting it up into services, uh, but this is uh, uh, just for demo purposes. We also have, once we get into the analysis and once the system proposes to us how to refactor this application, it all also has this nice spider chart that tells us what is going to be the refactoring effort. So with the two by two uh, diagram that I showed you before, this is a low debt, low effort kind of an application. So um, so usually just replatform it and put it, move it to the containerize it and move it to the cloud as is. Okay, let's see what we can do with this platform. So let's start with this larger service here. When we click on it, we see its name. It's called the Modify Fulfillment Service. Uh, the Modify Fulfillment Service has two entry points to the service. So two methods that logically invoke the service. We can click on Explore Tree. Explore Tree shows us a familiar view that we see from uh, in profilers, let's say, like classes and methods calling each other. And the platform actually allows us to focus only on, on our, our first party code or the code that we wrote, the, the supplication code, and even hide classes that are very common that should that appear in many of the services. And this allows us to really focus on, on the core business logic of the service and it kind of get a sense of what the service does. So these marker icons are entry points to the service up until these marker icons that are um, calls to other services. So here it's it used to be um, a method call. Once there's a, a marker icon here, it's really, it should be turned into an API call. So we have two different entry points, so two different flows that make up the service. Um, we understand ex as what it does, so we can go back uh, and, and explore the, ser the service further. In this application, we see five classes that were found during the dynamic analysis with 80% exclusivity. It means that four of these classes are exclusive and one is not. We can click on view, see those four classes that are exclusive and one that's not exclusive. And another class that's an infra. So infra classes are, are classes that are very common. For instance, a logger here. Um, and so these classes should be put in a common library of course, uh, classes that should that the system says that should be in, placed in a common library are classes that you as architects should review and decide if they're really common classes, utility classes, classes that rarely change because you don't want classes in a common library to be classes that change very often because that would mean that you'll have to uh, redeploy and retest uh, all of your services with every uh, modification to this common library. Um, so we have the exclusive and the infra, and, but we have the non-exclusive classes as well. So these are classes that the system kind of made no determination about them, what, what you should do with them. So that's your to-do list as developers. Um, so here, let's look at the shipping service class as part of this modify fulfillment controller. I can click on the details here. The system will tell me from which services it's actually called. So here I see that it's called from the Modify Fulfillment controller, but also from the shipping price controller. Let's say that as an architect, I'm gonna make a call that I want this ship shipping service. It's very important for me that this shipping service class is only called from within the shipping price controller. And I need to modify the boundaries of the services in order to make this class exclusive to the shipping price controller. So what I'll do, I'll click here, in the modified fulfillment controller, it'll take me to the right place in the code 
where there's a call from the mother fan fulfillment service to the shipping service. And I'll then create an entry point to the shipping price controller. What it means is that instead of this method call, I'm gonna treat this as an API call. So here there's the service boundary now, service ends here. And he, from this point on as another service starts. And with every modification that you make to the architecture, the system in the background recalculates all of the dependencies and all of the metrics. And we see a new architecture view. So if you'd noticed, so now we have a new dotted line from this modified fulfillment controller to this service here, which is the shipping price controller. When we hover over it, we see that this is the shipping service fetch shipping charges. This is the method that we just made it into an API. Uh, and if we look at the modified fulfillment controller, we see uh, that there's 100% exclusivity because now the, the class that was previously not exclusive is simply not within the service anymore. Another way to look at these services is through the use of resources. So resources are those objects that I mentioned before that might hint to the domain of the service or pose a constraint to extracting it. So let's say database transactions are a good example for a type of constraint or, or monitors and locks and synchronization objects uh, are another example. So here, let's look at the resources. So we see that in the modified fulfillment service, there are four exclusive uh, resources, two of them spring beans. I'll actually click on the type so you see two of them beans and two uh, read-only transactions. When I look at the non-exclusive ones, I see a few database tables, some transactions and a file. The file is a log file, omslog.txt. So I don't really care about that. Let's focus on the database tables. So for instance, let's we see this order line table. So order line table, again, I see I can as, as exactly as if it were, were a class, uh, I can click on the details and see what other flows access this database table. So for instance, the Spotify Fulfillment Controller and the Order Controller both access this order line database table. Um, again, let's say that I want to uh, make this order line table exclusive to the Order Controller. I don't want the Modify Fulfillment Controller to directly access any database tables um, that are related to the order tables to the order service. So again, I can click here, uh, I can jump to the right place in the code where the modify fulfillment service is calling the sales order class. And from here through Hibernate, it calls the service. So this, and, and, and this is a demo, right? So don't judge me for adding an entry point on an entity class, but um, so here I'm adding an entry point from a modified fulfillment service to the order service. I now added a, a, a new uh, service call. I see the, the analysis running in the background. I see this uh, progress bar right here. When I go back to the services, I see a new call right here to the order controller. Now, if I look at the order controller and I look at its resources and the exclusive resources, I will see that this order line table is now exclusive to the order table to the order service and it's and not used in the modify um, uh, the modify fulfillment service. Uh, the system even allows me to look at the database tables separately, like as a resource report, and get to uh, once I have a good architecture, I can I can see, okay, let me see based on the order the, the database tables that I have. Uh, which ones are only used in a single service. So those that are only used in a single service can be moved to a database of that microservice. Um, the ones that are non-exclusive, we may need to refactor some, um, to refactor that a little bit. So for instance, this payment info, we see that it's, it's, it is still used in the modified fulfillment controller and the order controller. But that gives us a very good hint um, on what we need to uh, refactor. We can also see this, by the way, not a, but by resource, but by service and say, okay, the order controller needs these database tables, the modified fulfillments needs these database tables, 
um, and get an understanding of uh, the database model after we refactor the application and after we extract services out of it. Uh, lastly, I'll also show you some static analysis. So of course we add a static analysis on top of this. Um, static analysis, we see here that there are more classes. So we see 14 classes and not three classes. And also the exclusivity is lower than the dynamic exclusivity. Um, but here it tells us um, uh, which classes, let's look, let's start with the modified fulfillment controller. So we see here, like a, a, the, the dependency graph. So we see that the modified fulfillment controller class that we bring has a dependency on the logger, on sales order, and on the modified fulfillment service, which, is, which in turn has all of these dependencies. Now let's say that this email request DTO um, is not really a dependency. We see that it doesn't run. We see these yellow dots. So we didn't see them running. Anything with a yellow dot, we didn't see running in the, during the dynamic analysis. So we can say, or the sales order repository, which is not used anymore because now it's only used within the sales order. So we can mark it as dead code. So clicking on, on this, there's an option to mark this as dead code. Marking it as dead code will tell the system to go and recalculate all of the compile time dependencies, but make sure to remove the dependency of that specific class from this service. So now the modified fulfillment service, which was modified, you see this little asterisk here, um, it doesn't have a dependency on this grayed out sales order repository. So when we will decide to extract this service, the system will know to modify this class and remove all mention of this specific class in order to remove the dependency. And with it, of course, it will remove all the dependencies of the sales order repository class um, and, uh, and, and basically untangle our code. Now this dead code uh, and, and thinning out these dependencies is actually really important because as we develop, these things only grow. Uh, so you only add more and more dependencies into your code and you never really take them out. Uh, and there's a lot of dead code and dead flows. So that code could be like code that you don't run anymore, that just simply, simply doesn't run anymore because you added new functionality and kind of diverted that code. But it could be code that doesn't run in a specific context. So it could be like a class that uh, serves two different domains, for one domain, half of it is called, and for another domain, another half of it is called. So essentially, when you think about refactoring that class, what you should do is split it into two and delete half of it depending on, um, on the service, because for that specific domain, half of that class is dead code. And the system knows how to find those pieces of dead code automatically, especially when you do your dynamic analysis on production. Um, and, uh, and clean out your dependencies and, and do some refactoring there. I'll go back to services. There's one last thing to show you guys. Uh, by the way, there's like a D uh, badge here. That means that there are dead uh, classes it's because we mark this dead class. Of course, when um, there are large trees of classes that are not used, the system knows how to pick up those dead classes automatically through its AI. Um, but let's say we decided, okay, this is the architecture. And for now, I want to extract this piece here, the order controller. I want to extract this and all of its database tables. So with V function, it's very easy. I click on the plus sign here. Um, as I click on the plus sign, uh, now I have these candidates for extraction, the order controller with its common library. The service creation tab is suddenly available. It gets highlighted. And here I have this service here, order controller, which is also, so it's also gonna be an endpoint of the system, but it's also gonna serve this service here, which is the modified fulfillment uh, controller. I can configure it to generate endpoints for this service. And when I click download, it will download three files. The one is the specification file or the recipe on how to create this order controller. 
One is to um, create a common library that will serve all of the services. And another is a YAML file that I'll open up here, which is really the open API specification or the Swagger file um, for this order controller. So you can really understand, okay, this is what I just extracted. I have this new slash order API that is actually calling um, the sales order uh, with the DTOs that are uh, defined below. I can also call the API order customer order ID to get the order ID, um, et cetera. So this is, so this is nice. Uh, I have this um, this specification file um, that tells me that, um, okay, the configuration comes from spring root config with a minimized spring configuration that's added right here. Resource files that you need for the service. These are the classes that are required for the service. These are the, the jars that are the dependencies that are required. Um, the sales order class needs to uh, be modified. And the only thing that it needs is the get order lines table. So we don't, so that's the dead code that we configured. Uh, and running this and providing this input, this recipe to a V function tool called code copy will create a service for you. And the only thing that's left is to uh, compile it either with Maven or Gradle, both, both a POM file will be created and a Gradle script will be created. Um, and, and you can create those services, containerize them and run them on the cloud. Uh, I'll pause here. I'll go back to the analysis screen and I'll go check if there's questions in the Q&A or the chat. You had two questions. Thanks. So, uh, okay, one question is how do you factor entanglement of applications into the assessment? So, so this isn't. So this is a good question. The two pieces that we found. So we did extensive research on this. Um, so, for instance, okay, this is maybe a, a kind of a. It is a demo application, but. We did a lot of research on what goes into technical debt within the application. And we found that the two most contributing factors to the technical debt, one is the entanglement of the classes, which is exactly this complexity index. And the other is the length of the dependency chains, which is this risk index. What these dependencies chains affect is really, if you change something in one place in your code, how, what are the chances for it to affect other parts of the application? So if there are long dependency chains, that's exactly the risk. The, this entanglement is, okay, let's say I want to take out a, a class and put it in a different service. How much of the tree or the graph I need to take with me? So the, the higher the entanglement, um, the higher the debt, the higher the risk, the higher the debt. And the risk and the entanglement, we found them to be quite uncorrelated in applications. Um, and so both of these together, along with uh, many other parameters, but these are the two main contributors, go into the calculation of this debt index, out of which we infer um, the level of debt and how much you're spending on innovation versus how much you're actually paying to uh, repaying the debt. Um, Okay, so exclusivity, I think maybe, uh, I don't know when this question was uh, asked. Uh, maybe I, I hope I, I explained it a little bit a few times during the, the demo itself, but exclusivity really think about it as the percentage of classes that are only in a specific service. So the overall exclusivity, we have here the overall exclusivity of the application and here is 88%. It means that 88% of the classes appear only in a single service. Uh, but for every service here, it's gets its own uh, exclusivity score, which is how many of these classes exist only or needed only for this specific service. So these three classes that we see in this inventory controller are not called anywhere else. If we take them out of all of the, the code, except the service that we just created, no other code is supposed, no other 
service is supposed to access them or run them or call any method in them. So that is exclusivity. So it's it's really a measure of um, the modularity of your code. So if the exclusivity is high, then you, you have good modularity in your code. So um, with high entanglement, what we discussed before, or high complexity, you probably won't get to very high exclusivity scores. Uh, you get to like medium exclusivity scores and you probably have to work hard in order to untangle the code. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and get to a better uh, um, architecture. By the way, here, I wanna show you something that's part of the uh, refactoring effort. So this refactoring effort is also, so now we, we kind of played around with exclusivity. So the exclusivity is higher than it was before when we started, <clears throat> but, but because we added many service to service calls, we kind of made the service topology more complex. So now we see that this medium effort, maybe the effort is not uh, in those, uh, in, in untangling the code and, um, and dealing with class exclusivity, but now we kind of move the complexity into uh, how we deploy and uh, manage the application just by looking at the service to service call. So this is interestingly, interestingly like a blanket that you just try, are trying to pull based on your um, organization's cloud maturity and what is important to you as architects to kind of put more emphasis on. Um, uh, another question, which languages are supported for the assessment analysis to work? So currently the, what I just showed you is a Java application. Uh, it works mainly on Java applications at the moment. Uh, we are releasing a .NET version of this platform soon. Uh, the .NET version will be available for beta in June uh, and will be released for uh, general availability come September. So if you're interested uh, to do this on a .NET application, please um, contact us. Okay, I'll pass the ball over to you, uh, Samantha. Yep. You want to share the last slide, Amir? Sure. Yes. All right, cool. So, uh, no, first off, thanks everybody for attending. Um, we are offering a two week trial for anybody who's attended. Um, this is only available for the next two weeks. So, if you happen to do it three weeks from now, it's not, but we would love to have you try it out. Um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask myself or Amir, and I'll go ahead and post the link to the trial in the chat so you have it. And with that being said, I will pass back to HP. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you, Amir. I think uh, that was very interesting. Um, very clear for sure. Good demo. Um, I don't know if there are any remaining questions from uh, the audience. This is your last chance. Thanks for the trial code. Yep, no problem. Great. And if there are not, no more questions, I'd like to thanks everyone for, for joining. Thanks, Amir and Samantha. And, uh, and um, um, I will close the call. Thanks a lot.